are we switching? Oh, so welcome everyone. Where are we from? Um, should I look here and see where all the, oh, Okotoks? Yeah, we've got Acadia and Rocky Cord. I don't even know where some of those places Chris. are. But hello. You're supposed to wave so that we know you're alive there. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> okay, gardening. Sorry if I forget to look at you. I have actually never done this before where I have to look at you and look at you. So if I ignore you, I know that's going to be something. But if I ignore them, so, that's something else. You ready for the presentation part? Yeah. Okay. Oh, so she's writing it from the back of the room. Excellent. Oh, I already moved on to the second slide, so the people haven't seen the first slide. So it's no space, no problem. Oh, you're changing them or I'm changing them? You're changing them. I'm changing them. Okay, here we are. Cultivate yeah, creatively right. in vertical garden. They can't see you when this is up. Oh, they can't see me, so I don't have to look at you. Do I need a microphone or anything? No, it's all part of the camera. This yeah, is amazing. Like, How many people have been to one of these sessions already? Never. 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 What is going on here? This is like the 21st or uh, 3rd century. I don't know where we are. So first things first, because after I had that, that experience with the women in Barhead quite a few years ago, they actually invited me back at the 25th anniversary. It was their very first ever women's conference. And I was their first speaker. I'm very really disappointed. They had me back 25 years later at the 25 oh, wow. year conference and they said they remembered it fondly and I said thank you, I don't even remember what I said. <laughs> Here we are so many years later. But I still ask that question, why? Why are we gardening? Do we have a lot of gardeners in this room? Gardeners? Yay! Why do we do it? No, it's just some people are just here as friends, spouses, supporters. Oh, I try, but I fail. Oh, you try, but you fail? Yeah. Okay, well, I second now. <laughs> oh, okay. So I'm going to start with why. Why do we garden? Because that I always love that question. And I love it because food security is such a huge issue now. When, when you think about it, uh, 9 out of 10 heads of lettuce sold in North America is grown in California. That's crazy. We can grow lettuce. That is one thing we can do on the prairies, right? We can grow lettuce. But we don't. 9 out of 10 heads of lettuce comes from California. And I guess that wouldn't necessarily be your biggest worry in life, except I took my grandkids to, oh, you can't read, oh, Grizzly River. I guess it's on. Do you think that's cut off, that little bit at the top? There it is. Yeah. It's cut off. Grizzly River Run. I took my grandkids to um, Disneyland, and they were so excited. There's a huge water slide, the biggest ever water slide. And we went there and lined up, and there was this sign, sorry, river levels are too low for rafting today. Come back soon. We're only there for two days, right? We're flown down from Calgary. We're in LA for two days. And that is the problem. If they don't have enough water to run a ride at Disneyland, I don't think they have enough water for the food that they're going to then ship up to us. So, you know, it really didn't sink in until I was right there at Disneyland. I was like, hey, wait a minute. And I think it's pretty assumed, and we all know that we need bees. And we need them because otherwise we're not going to have almonds, we're not going to have kiwis, we're not going to have apples. This is something that we need. And bees have been dying, especially the introduced bees. The honeybees are introduced. Now we should try to preserve our local bees, which is even more important than honeybees. But we need bees of all kinds to pollinate food. And of course, bees have been going diminishing in numbers. And I went to a lecture about bees because bees are so exciting and found out that the uh, Queen bees are laying fewer and fewer eggs every time. They used to lay thousands, and now they're laying maybe 1,200. And then those little babies that they're laying, um, the researchers have told me that when they go and look at the hives, they suddenly are dying, and it's because there's no worker bees anymore. You know worker bees? Callie, thank you, Callie, I forgot to thank you. Callie is a good example from the library of a worker bee. So <laughs> when all the worker bees are gone, you end up with nobody to feed yeah. the young. And that's what's happened. Because they're laying fewer eggs, and because the bees are not living as long, they can't get enough food back. So then the worker bees say, oh, not enough food coming in to feed all the young. So they have to go out. And now they're all out there. And this is part of the problem. Now there's not enough bees left in the hive to feed the colony. So a researcher down in the States discovered that bark mulch, I don't know if you know, we don't have a pointer. How are we going to point to the other communities? 
because our lovely fingers, as you can see, are not going to reach into those <laughs> other communities. But you can see in this example of bark mulch, this is just in my garden, you see all the white stuff. The white stuff is the mycelium, which is like the roots of fungus. What the researchers found out is that bees, especially honeybees, need to find a place where mycelium are growing because the reason mycelium work is because they are breaking down rocks into all those little component parts and they also are producing enzymes to do that and that little enzyme called p cumeric acid after i went to this lecture i had to go home and google it p cumeric acid actually can go into the bee because bees do not have a liver like we have a liver if we eat something and it's toxic like we're always talking about the herbicides this and herbicides that but in fact we have livers we can break a lot of that down bees do not have livers they need p cumeric acid so gardeners everywhere can add bark mulch to the gardens, which will increase the amount of uh, mycorrhiza, will increase the mycelium from the fungus, will give the bees some hope. So I just wanted to tell you that, how interconnected these things are. So that's all about food security. But then there's food safety. I don't know if you know this, but 80% of the garlic sold in the world comes from China. Does that seem ridiculous? Mm -hmm. Can we not grow garlic? Did every Ukrainian grandmother in this room not yeah. grow garlic at some time? And garlic is so easy to grow. But 80% is grown in China. Are we feeling pretty good about that regards food security and food safety? No, I'm not feeling too good about that. Then I found this little article, I just pulled this on my shelf yesterday, and it said, of course they have a picture of meat. Notice this is chicken and chicken parts, and you can barely recognize the meat. But in the article, it says millions of packages of fruits and vegetables that were shipped to 50 U.S. states, Canada, and Mexico are having listeria-linked illnesses. So this article was saying, really, if you've got any food in your freezer, you better just throw it out because it's probably bad. So this whole food safety thing is different than food security. And then there's the plants, the dirty dozen. And I don't have the whole dozen here, but spinach is an example of one of the dirty dozen because it's watered with water that comes from, they want more of our water, but let's face it, we want to give them so much water or we won't have any water. Uh, they're watering with water. I guess by the time the Columbia River gets to Mexico, it's just a slough. There's actually no river left. There's no water left. We saw and, a documentary. Oh, have you seen a documentary on that? Anyway, it's really bad. So the situation is that there's poor water quality and so a lot of the food we're getting, and I know there's often recalls on things like green onions and spinach and beans and tomatoes and potatoes. So it's terrible. Now, speaking of potatoes, if you've ever read about potatoes, and what I've read, when, especially when I was starting the garden, they said, put your potatoes on the windowsill. Have you seen this? Have you seen anyone saying this? Because if you leave them in the cupboard this time of year, what happens to potatoes? They get those long sprouts, they're in the dark, they're in the bag, they're in the cupboard, they are sprout. Well, if your potatoes are in the dark right now, take them out because they need to be put on your counter where they can get some light. They don't have to be on the windowsill, they can just be anywhere, they don't need direct light, they can even be happy with fluorescent light. Pull off all those big long things that are growing, if they're growing, and just set them out and let them sprout because when they sprout, you will get uh, pre-growth so that when we finally get real spring you remember what spring actually looks like yeah. when we finally get that they'll already be starting to grow and then you can put them outside so i'm just going to have you because we're talking about food security think back to that mcdonald's advertisement about 10 years ago when that person and i don't know who they are they bought that mcdonald's hamburger and they took a picture of it every day for like a year yeah. and that hamburger never changed it always looked more or less the same and these potatoes are the these potatoes are four months old. They're still sitting on my windowsill waiting to sprout. Because what most people, I interviewed um, John from Eagle Creek Farms just by in the sill. You guys know John, Eagle Creek Farms? He's an organic potato farmer. He's third generation potato farmer, but the first organic. Because he told me they were spraying three times a year for various leaf blight diseases. And then they sprayed them in the fall to kill them to make sure they died before they harvested them. And then as soon as they put them into storage, they sprayed them so that they wouldn't sprout. So potatoes that you buy at the store or maybe fries, which Rita and I had tonight for supper, have been sprayed at least five times. So don't worry about the bees. You should start worrying about yourself if you're not growing your own potatoes. 
Anyway, these potatoes, these potatoes are four months on my windowsill and they have not started to sprout. So I think I threw them out because my husband finally said, exactly what are those potatoes doing on the windowsill? <laughs> I was like, well, you know what? Nothing. So gardens are part of that big picture, that big world picture. And I read this really fascinating book called Terra Preta. And if you haven't read this book, it's really interesting. And basically, everyone's worried about climate change. Are you guys worried about climate change? Yeah, too much. Yeah, a little bit, maybe. Maybe we're not worried about global warming because it's so damn cold, but we're worried about change. Just when you get those big storms, you get those things. So what we want to do is try to conserve more carbon and hang on to it. And we now know that organic matter levels, which are measured in your soil, every time you can increase your organic matter level by 1%, you can take a ton of carbon out of the air for every 100 square meter garden you have. Now, if you're not metric, you'll know that 100 square meters is 1,000 square feet. So for every 1,000 square feet, you can take one ton of carbon out of the air every time you um, can keep one more percentage. And in our soils here in Alberta, we usually have about 8%, but of course those rates have been dropping. We're down to 7, 6, 5. And that's part of this um, global climate change. Okay, so for 100, I should have probably for the um, people in the other room should have pulled that up earlier. But bonus two that they found out is that the more, not the more, the better your soil becomes, the less you need to actually spray because the better soil takes care of your plants. So we'll get to that a little bit later. Or you could read this book at page 89. I just copied it right out of there. So, my thing is, maybe you're saying, well, I would love to grow potatoes. We used to grow potatoes when we were on the farm, but we just don't have room anymore. And then there's my husband, who's part Irish, part Scottish. Okay, I'm Robbie Burns Bay, he's Scottish. And on the other days, <laughs> he put his normal eating supper days, and he's Irish, because his parents were Irish and Scottish. So, we really don't have room to grow the number of potatoes that you might think a family would, or one Scottish-Irish person would need to eat. So... This is where you have to get creative. So they cultivate creatively. But where? Okay, so that leads to our topic today, no space, no flow. So you can grow up. You can grow your gardens up. You don't have to grow them up. And potatoes, we're usually thinking they have to be planted in rows in the garden. We've even got a picture in our mind what a potato field might look like. Forget about it. That's, that's, that's so Donna in 1978, right? We don't have to worry about that anymore. We've got new stuff. So what is a vertical garden? Well, this is my little garden in downtown Calgary when I had my house there, and it's a little balcony that's the only place, for, sorry, I'm thinking everybody's seeing this, but it's the only place that we had any sun because everywhere else was big trees. So these are little containers called maxi caps, which are just styrofoam cap coolers really with water in them because I couldn't always get up to that second floor balcony and water them. And this little balcony I produced so many squash. This is what happened to the plants. They grew off the balcony. And we had a house sitter once staying in our garage. And he came in from the garage. It was dark. And he hit his head on something. He thought he was gonna, he thought he was being hit on the head. It was a spaghetti squash. And I hit him in the head. And so I just want to say you don't have to have a big space. You can grow spaghetti squash if you have a tiny balcony or you have a big space. It doesn't matter. You can be creative. And so growing up on a balcony is one suggestion. This is my book partner, Stephen's Garage. He has quite a big ladder that goes up to that garage. And because he has small children, he put a token kind of a fence. Now this would not be a CSA approved fence or anything that might stop children from actually hurting themselves. But he put a little fence around it. And then on top of his balcony, he planted his squash on the top of the, the roof, I mean, of his garage. And they, of course, did the same thing. They spilled off. So you don't need a lot of space as long as you've got sun and water. These are the two things you need. So rooftop gardening is a definite, definite plus. I went to Holland for Floriad. Has anyone here been to Holland? A few people? Have you been to the Floriad? It's a big show when you come from Holland. So you go visit all this? No? It's, Floriad is every 10 years. They have all the new things happening in horticulture and you are invited because they want millions of people to come because that's how they play for it. I think it's really expensive. So I've only been once and that was a couple of years ago because my friend said we will soon be too old the next time there's a Floriad. I'm like, you might be too old. I'm not going to be too old next time there's a Floriad. So the living walls were the big thing. They had living walls all over Floriad. 
And a lot of people in North America aren't even in Floriad, but they know this. You can take an old palette, you can paint it blue, you can plant lobelia, and that's a fun way to grow things, right? Would you agree that's a fun way to grow things? Mm -hmm. Lots of fun. But my promise was no space, no problem. Did I say no space, big problem, or no space, lots of problems, or no space, better watch out for those problems. No, no problem. <laughs> So here's my living wall, which I got after I got back from Floriad, and it looks pretty good so far. I eh? got these little, uh, it's just a little unit that you buy, you plant all your little uh, things in there. And this is inside my greenhouse because I wanted to have the best environment for my strawberries. And they all got uh, aphids. So <laughs> next year, and you can see from this picture, um, there's just these small soil pockets. You water from the top and the water drains down and is supposed to. Now this is, um, in Monaco, the official green wall that the whole country is subscribing to. This is the green wall. This is the best green. Just think about it. This is the best. So you may as well get this one. So I told the supplier he should just give me this one because I should try it out. So it starts, you water from the top, it starts down, and the plants, you know, looking pretty good. You put something in them, you water them, you fertilize them. It looks pretty good so far, and it's all on the wall. I'm not even growing in the ground. That looks pretty good. Until that one morning when I walked into my greenhouse, this is how my kale looked in my living wall. Does that look like it's living? Does that look like it's no problem? <laughs> <laughs> so if you take a closer look, I drew a line there, and you can see the size of the cabbage worms. They had absolutely eaten every leaf. They weren't just taking one leaf for you, one leaf for me, you know, like it's, you know, we don't share. No, they were eating every leaf. I don't know where they were going to move after my green wall was dead, living wall, but they ate every leaf. So to me, I'm thinking, well, that's not really no problem. That is a problem. This, at the same week, this is outside, this is me and my kale outside from my vegetable garden outdoors. And indoors, which is my protected, happy place, my greenhouse, the kale was all dead. There is a problem with the green walls. And the problem is you have to force feed your plants, right? You're, you're really in charge. You are the nurse in charge. You're the nurse on duty. You have to look at them and say, I detect you're a little short on nitrogen today. And then you have to give them those couple of drops of nitrogen. Or perhaps it's phosphorus. I'm just doing an analysis in my head here. I mean, the commercial growers, they send out a leaf, and they do a leaf analysis, and it costs them 75 bucks each time, but you've only got five strawberry plants, or seven <laughs> kale plants, you're probably not sending it out for an analysis. So, the situation with things like green moss is that you have to be the nurse. And if you are not willing for that responsibility, and frankly, I am a gardener, I'm not a nurse, I don't want to look at my plant every five minutes and go, Hmm, I'm detecting a little zinc shortage there. Maybe I should deal with that. No, that's just too much like work. So I like to just naturally feed my soils. I do add some fertilizer, some organic fertilizer, but I make compost, right? That's what we do as gardeners. We make compost and we put that in. This is my new compost maker called Speedy Bin, because I don't know if you know this, but I moved to Vancouver Island and guess what? Every time you check your compost, you have to bang it about five times because then the rats will Oh. And so I had a bit of a problem with mice in my composting calorie, but I'd never seen rats, and they're quite large. Uh. So the speedy bin is metal, and it has a metal bottom, and it has a metal top, and it has a locking lid. And so even um, raccoons, who are pretty smart, can't figure out how to open that lid. So I've switched over. I do all my composting in speedy bins. It makes the same compost, and because it's closed like that, it gets quite hot inside, and that's why it's the speed bin. It just warms up faster, we can get faster compost. So that's good for gardens. So moving along, because I'm realizing I'm already halfway out of time. Are we going to 8? No, 7.30. Yeah, we can go till 8. Oh, we're just going to be talking. Can you guys all get a sleeping bag? We're going to be here for months. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, what works? Espalier works. I was in this most precious little garden in Oregon. We walked into the gate, and she had these beautiful screens with that gorgeous little metal screen, Espalier. And all of her apples were on Espalier. And of course, when I was in Europe, everybody had rock walls, because in the olden days, you couldn't really afford to get a natural gas pipeline brought into your yard, so you had to 
do things like they actually had wood burning furnaces in some of their walls, and they would have pipes in the walls, and they could heat up their walls so that they could do things like a scallion. Now nobody's going to go to that extreme anymore, like lighting a gas fireplace or even a wood fireplace to heat up their walls, but that's just the way. Um, a spalier is just a way to grow trees, which means you don't let it become a bush. You still grow it in the ground because being grown in the ground, being grounded, that is the way plants want to grow. They don't want to grow on a wall or on a roof, really. They want to grow in the ground. So a spalier is just one way, oops, sorry, one way you want to do that. And there's many types of spalier I found out when I was touring England. It's not really just about the one way you can buy them at the store. They actually can make big fans and they still get the same yields. So if you really are thinking you want to save space and grow up, you can do espaliers. And surprise, surprise, when I went to the garden centers, they're all selling these little espalier trees that are already pretty good. Some are more than one variety. It's very fun. So that's just one way that you can grow up is you can grow trees that have been espaliered. But maybe you're thinking, all I want is a tomato plant. All I want is just a little, does anyone have a new little tomato started in their house? <laughs> so they're so cute when they're little and they all want to get the sun and they start to turn yellow. If you see these leaves turning yellow, they start to turn yellow and then that means they need, well, I'm not even a nurse and I need that, they need nitrogen. So at this stage, when they've got their first true leaves, these are the baby leaves, those little pale ones, and these are the first true leaves. Once they've got the first true leaves, you just throw them out when you transplant them and you, you grow them. And I used to grow mostly determinate plants. And this is a very technical word. And I'm just going to tell you, I went to a dog training school with my puppy and I found it very confusing because there were so many new words. They were always using new words. So here I am saying determinant, indeterminate. You guys can't determine whether I'm crazy or what's going on. But indeterminate just means it's staking. It never stops getting taller and taller and taller and taller. Tomatoes will get maybe 30 feet tall if you let them grow. So you have to tie them up because there's no other way around it. And if you decide not to grow tomatoes that are you know, indeterminate, and you grow the little ones, yeah, they're cute, but you only get like half a dozen tomatoes because they only aren't getting any bigger, so you're not getting any more. But when you have the staking tomatoes or the indeterminate, they just keep getting taller and you keep getting more leaves. And of course, cucumbers, isn't that? I just had to show this picture because it's just so pretty. They always get their own little curl that they can hang on, so you don't have to train them to hang on. Again, you don't have to be the nurse, you can just <coughs> put them out there and they'll climb up. And so you need strings to do that. So here's the, we call him the helpful husband because he's a retired engineer, so. <laughs> he can't do any engineering in my house, but he can be helpful in other ways. So he'll be, build me this lovely trellis in my greenhouse with these little eye hole screws. I don't even know all the proper names. So I chose this beautiful hemp string because it was so charming. It looked so nice. And I thought this way I can just compost it because I've been talking to some commercial growers and they have to bury their old tomatoes at the end of the season with their tractors because they've got all those big hair, terrible strings that aren't breaking down. And I didn't want that in my garden because I wanted those nice, well, there's just a close up of that beautiful architecture. Yes, hopeful husband is busy. <laughs> so I grew uh, cucumbers and then uh, the next year I grew, oh, cucumbers, very lovely cucumbers. As you can see, this is my lovely granddaughter with my lovely cucumbers. Now, some cucumbers actually need to be pollinated, and you have to pay attention when you order them. I specifically ordered the greenhouse cucumbers because I, this time, was planting them in my greenhouse because I really, really wanted the greenhouse cucumbers, and they were so good. I thought, you know, I didn't even cover that in Why Bother Growing about how good things are. Like, I can't even go to the restaurant and eat salad anymore because I'm just so spoiled. Yeah. But when you've grown your own cucumbers, how many people grow their own cucumbers? Taste. Isn't the taste amazing? So you just, I, I just actually grow too many cucumbers. <laughs> I gave one to a neighbor and um, her husband came back later and he'd been fishing and gave me a salmon. I was like, well, that was a pretty good treat. <laughs> and, um, I gave someone to somebody else and they dropped by and gave me a big jar of honey. I'm like, I'm going to go into business. Just trade. Trade me for anything. But anyways, you will manage to get too many cucumbers. But anyways, the next year you don't want to, you want to shake it up. You don't want to always be growing cucumbers, right? You have to trade, you sometimes cucumbers, sometimes tomatoes, because they use different minerals in the soil. And if you always grow the same plant in the same place, you will have problems. Something will happen. So I got these beautiful tomatoes from the seed catalog. And my daughter said to me, she said, Mom, um, did you notice that this package was $12.95? I was like, well, no, I'm actually two notice. <laughs> I bought them online. I was just looking at all the pretty pictures. I clicked this one. I thought, Hamlet. 
Doesn't that sound like a great tomato? Look at that tomato. Have you seen a better tomato anywhere? So Hamlet was quite production, quite producing quite a bit, and I was quite excited, even though I only got 10 seeds for $12.95. I know, I was a little shocking. <laughs> and then I started picking them, and they tasted exactly like they look. How do they look? Delicious. They look like rubber balls. I'm sorry, they do look delicious, but they also look like rubber balls. And so I realized they didn't taste good. So I packaged them up and put them in little boxes into the sign free. Two days later, a guy comes by and he says, so hey, are you, like he didn't know because I had them outside my gate, just a little sign. Hey, are you the lady that grew these tomatoes? And I thought, oh, somebody's coming by to try, you know, thank me, maybe give me a steak. Maybe they're going to bring me a fish. I don't know what they're going to do. Honey, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I grew, I grew those tomatoes. And he said, really? You grew those tomatoes? And I said, yeah, yeah, I did. And he said, you know what? Those are the worst tomatoes I've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, thanks for sharing. <laughs> anyway, they are pretty bad. So why then did I reorder those tomatoes last year? Because $12.95, that's a lot of money for tomatoes. Because guess what? When I was storing tomatoes, I like to keep some in the freezer, some in the fridge, some in my little boxes under the bed, you know, so you can keep them as long in the fall as you want. All those really soft tomatoes, those beautiful, luscious Japanese black trofello and exotic names, they start to just melt down. It's like a, an apocalypse. They're just like, Boo. one day potato, tomato, next day just jello, right? Boo. Not the hamlets. The hamlets look exactly the same in October. November, <laughs> December, <laughs> and I ate my last one on January 15th, and you know, it tasted pretty good on January 15th, and it reminded me, it's really just a store tomato. I had accidentally bought commercial tomatoes, and they always taste like that from the store. We just don't expect that. Mm -hmm. And I kind of like that, so this year I've started just five seeds because I don't want so many of them, but I want a few that will last me into the winter because I have this new thing where I don't want to always be able to buy the tomatoes because of that water thing, that Disneyland thing. Anyway, I had to move away. I forgot to tell you that about the tomatoes after that long story. Those tomatoes were so highly producing that one day I walked into the greenhouse and all 60 pounds of tomato had broken that string and they were lying on the ground. Maybe there was a hundred pounds. I don't know how many pounds there were. There were so many pounds that they were lying on the ground. So we had to go with the, this looks like binder twine. It's that plastic string that you buy. It doesn't look nice, but we had to use that. So I'm just like a commercial grower now. I have to get that plastic string <laughs> because when I went in that day and all of my potatoes were lying on the ground, I don't know. You want to have things last a bit. Anyway, so one way to get plants to grow up, but I guess I wasn't really explaining that too well, plastic strings are better than hemp strings for longevity. But if you have a helpful husband or happen to be helpful yourself, you can build fences and things like wooden structures because that's something that's going to last you probably five to ten years. The string, even at its best, is only going to last a few years. And so we have our whole fence. This was just a design idea I had. Rita knows me here. She knows I'm a bit of a designer. So I had this idea, why don't I create this fence that I can train? Because even pumpkins will grow up a fence. You can get a 50-pound pumpkin hanging off a tendril that's only uh, the size of your baby finger. And they'll be hanging there from that little string. So I thought, why don't we build our fence? Instead of wasting that space, we'll build our fence, and it'll be a nice little cross-section. And those spaghetti squash just love it. Well, guess what else love that fence? The bunnies. The rats. The other miscellaneous wobbling. The cats from next door. Because we left this generous six inch wide spacing that they all came in. And those bunnies eat quite a bit. Quite a bit of uh, waste went to the bunnies. But anyways, whether it's beans or it's squash or it's pumpkins, you know, there's various styles. I really like this little style after you're inside your fence, just like a drying rack that you would dry your clothes on. Just two pieces of wood lean together with a few little sidebars. Mm -hmm. It's just something that, and it's got a hinge on the top, like a little piano hinge. You just close it up and put it away. Easy does it. Some people are really good gardeners. This is not from my garden. And they do the wooden fence, but they also put the pea mesh on their, on their plants. They want to be really good gardeners. They never want to lose pea. 
You know, I forgot to put my favorite pea in here, and I just ate one yesterday. It's an absolute delicious pea. It's called Oregon Giant. Do people have favorite peas? Do you like the shelling peas? I used to like the shelling peas, but they're only ready for like three weeks, four weeks. Done. Then I discovered Oregon Giant. Well, then I used the flat pod peas. You can pass fry with those a bit, but not so fun to eat in the garden. You can't really cook them and eat them. And then there's the sugar snap peas that you buy at Costco where you eat the whole pod and the whole pea, and that's nice because you're getting more. You know, you get that huge plant, and that doesn't peas. It doesn't seem like you're getting very good value. And then I discovered Oregon Giant. They're sold as a um, flat potted pea. But when you go away accidentally, go away or on purpose on holidays, and you come back a week later, most peas would have already gotten too big, they would have turned brown, they would have split, and the rats would have eaten them, I don't know. So they would be gone. But the Oregon Giant peas, you're supposed to eat them when they're slim, but you can actually, they'll once they start to puff out, you can eat them like sugar pod peas. So they actually are like sugar snap peas. So they're really great. They're like I consider a multi-purpose pea. They're so good that I picked some of the pods last year and I put them up on my shelf in my greenhouse and then I forgot about them and then they fell off the shelf. And sometime around February when the soil in, in the greenhouse was starting to warm up, they started to grow. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> and just yesterday I picked peas. So I left them because I didn't know I had been that sloppy. And I had a pea from my Oregon giant strudel, which was pretty neat. But you can also make a tea pea. I was up in Fort Chip once for a project and I had never actually been inside the teepee, and I quite liked that architecture. And then I took a trip to, this was in um, Quebec, and I noticed that they were using those little cloth bags that they sell now, and they'd put one pole in each bag and tied them at the top, and it was just like a teepee. And I thought, well, now that's easy. You don't even need a helpful husband to do something like a teepee. Although they're growing on this one, you can see Malabar spinach. Has anyone tasted Malabar spinach? It tastes like dirt. It's terrible. It's, it's woolly. It's a bit hairy. I mean, it's hard to grow. So people from warmer places like Toronto will say, oh, that Malabar spinach, that's pretty good. It's like Malabar. It's not like regular spinach. So you think, oh, that sounds nice. No, and it's really hairy. Like you don't, like with spinach, you're having a salad or something, you don't want something hairy. You don't want something that's rubbing the inside of your mouth the wrong way. Yeah, that's not nice. So forget about the plant, but the actual technique, I think that's very smart. So back to potatoes, because, you know, potatoes are now the bee in my bonnet with a Scottish slash Irish husband that never gets his share of potatoes. I decided I needed to come up with some new potato ideas. This is last fall's mini harvest. This was just a selection of what we had. I have to say, I don't know how the people in your family will do with the Russian blue potatoes, but at the very top here, you see the Russian blue. See how blue they are? They're almost purple, almost black. Well, inside, they're also purple. And when I served that potato, the helpful husband said, I hope you never grow those again. <laughs> <laughs> it was a delicious potato, don't get me wrong. But he's used to yellow potatoes and red potatoes. How do people get used to red potatoes? That's a new thing. Anyway, we, we are not growing them this year. This was last fall's harvest. But I will tell you that I really liked the German butterball. They're very buttery. They're very round. They have a very coarse skin, so they don't get scabby as much. And they're very nice. I really also liked the French fingerlings. Now, I order all my potatoes from Eagle Creek Farm, which is just here near Innisfil. And John always sends me at least one new kind. So last year was the pink fur. You see the pink fur? It's kind of like a French fingerling, but it's got these <coughs> asteroid-like structures coming off them, which makes them impossible to peel. And so you can bake them like that, but they always look a little funny. So I've kind of crossed those off my list. Anyway, every year he sends me some. The Ziegland, which is on the far right, is a lovely, what they would call, if you were at an expensive restaurant, what would they call that? Fingerling potato. So that's a very nice one. So we are growing Ziegling for the third year in a row now. So when you go home tonight and you look in your cupboard and see that your potatoes are sprouting wildly and you pull off the sprouts, then you put them out somewhere where they can just be, even just anywhere on the table. It doesn't matter. It could be your kid's bedroom. It doesn't matter. As long as it's not in the dark, because then you'll start to get these little sprouts. And these little sprouts that you can see on all these potatoes. See, I took this picture on March 16th. And then I took it again on March 29th, and then I put it home in there thinking I'd be disorganized. <coughs> so I would go back and take it on 
you know, April 15th and April 30th, which I forgot to do. But I just want you to see that they will form when they've got the light. Excuse me. Yep. Yeah. Hi, sorry to interrupt. I just have a quick question. I missed that. Why do you take the, the sprouts off of them? Because it's really hard to get them to grow properly. They want to get leaves. They're, lo they're weak. They're not attached well because they've grown so fast. So just take them off, get them out of their misery, and then set them out in light so that you can chit your potatoes ahead of time. And this is what they look like when they've been chitted. So they sprout just enough that they're ready to grow. They're sitting on your counter and they're ready. They will never get those long sprouts. They will sit there and guess how long they will sit there. John told me this, I did not know this. Even with four years of university and 30 years of experience, I did not know that potatoes will sit on your counter for eight to 10 weeks and not grow. They will just make that little sprout. And then the first day when you decide is the right day, to plant your potatoes, that's the day you take them off your counter and you plant them and then they're up the next day, really. You don't have to wait for them to start growing. So pre-chitting your potatoes has been a whole new license to me to just go crazy with varieties of potatoes. Does that answer the question? Yes, thank you. Okay. So when you get potatoes, and you should all be thinking about ordering potatoes now that we all know they've been sprayed minimum of five times if you buy them from a commercial supplier, you want to grow one or two potatoes we could be ordering them any time now they're starting to ship now. I just got my shipment last week. So what I decided was I needed a new way to grow potatoes because I don't have really a very big garden, considering all, all things considered, not enough to feed an Irishman anyways. So we went and bought some of this fencing. Now you might recognize this fencing as being sheep fencing or wire fencing or something you can buy at UFA co-op. And it comes in big rolls. And Keith then, after he cut, sorry, I used his name, Keith, we're supposed to call him helpful husband so he doesn't get embarrassed and, you know, somehow feel. <laughs> anyway, he cut off the ends, and every time there was a little piece here, he just took the, uh, whatever that thing is called, because I'm not the um, engineer, I'm the horticulturist, and just bent it over so we don't have any little ends sticking out. So he turned each piece of fence, and, you know, you have to go back to your old math. Like, remember the pi r squared thing? You have to figure out the radius to figure out how big something's. You don't want a potato fence that's nine feet across, right? Because that would be useless. How are you going to reach into the middle of that potato fence? So you want it just the right length. So I found in our experience that about four foot long piece of fence will make a nice little circle. Of course, Keith's an engineer, so he did the math first. So he did the calculations. I just did the eyeball thing. Let me see. I think, yeah, that yeah, could. So that makes the fence about this big around. So you can grow one potato in that fence. You put it in the bottom of the fence, and you add a little bit of compost, and then you can line the outside. I think I have a couple more slides, actually. Yeah, you put it in the bottom. Now, the trouble is I forgot to measure my arms. Do you know how long your arms are? If you add your two arms together, it's the same as your total height, right? So when you're working with a six-foot high potato fence, how long is my arm? It's not six foot long. So I realized that after I was completely set up, you guys are going to think I'm just ridiculous. <laughs> How long has she been gardening? <laughs> but I just had never done potatoes and fencing. Anyways, I've got a whole little video about this online. You can see it looks much nicer because I, I actually ended up taking the fence out and placing it on the ground and putting the fence around and redoing it. So yeah, that's how that looked. And then midsummer, um, as the potato grows, and then they start to come out the sides here, but as they grow, Oh, this is a banana. I can still read that label there. As they grow, they, they keep wanting to get taller. And so you can keep just lining the outside edge with straw and keep putting compost or some kind of soil in there. And I just used compost because they like to grow potatoes. The commercial people like to grow potatoes where the soil is the best. People think the soil gets prepared by the potatoes. No, the potato is a huge train robber. He takes all the nutrients out of the soil. So they like the good soil. So, um, and you can see this on my website. I've got all these pictures up there, so not to worry. Uh, as I was saying, as they grow and they get about six inches high, you can keep throwing compost with a bit more straw. And then finally in the end, oh, no, I thought I had another picture. Okay, I have to take you back to this one very important point. I'm just going to point this out once, which is that you've got your late season potatoes, your early season potatoes, your mid season potatoes, and your mid to late season potatoes. When you try to grow potatoes up instead of out, when you're growing them out, you go with the early season. Everybody knows, oh, come over for baby potatoes. Our whole supper tonight's baby potatoes because more of us are going to be ready early because they don't ever grow up. Each plant produces about seven potatoes. The potatoes never 
They never produce more than seven potatoes, but if you don't pick them as baby potatoes, they just get bigger and bigger and bigger. Finally, the whole family's coming for supper and you're bringing one potato. Right? Because, <laughs> because the warbles you don't have very many because they're an early potato, but each potato gets bigger. But when you get mid-season, like the Ziegland or the, or the Russet Urquita or the Russian Banana, the late-season ones, they just keep growing up and the little side sprouts as they grow up will produce potatoes. So you will never have an end. As long as you've got a season, you'll be covering it with plastic finally in September because you'll want it to grow longer. You want it to grow forever because the longer you let it grow, the more potatoes. You'll get 20 or 30 potatoes off each plant. Okay, skipping ahead. I should have put those slides in. I worked on this all day yesterday and all last week. Anyways, I always have a new correction, so I'll be correcting that when I get home. The other thing is the pergola. This is me. Helpful husband built me this lovely little pergola. And this is how it looks in the summer. So you can just plant something like grapes at the pergola. My son lives in Smithers, which is 12 hours north of Vancouver. And he has that little coronation, dark, dark, dark grape. Here, we can mostly do the riparian. We don't have good grapes here, but we have great, great leaves. And those leaves are fabulous dolmata. You can stuff rice in them and be really good. So the grapes come out, not so good. The, um, okay, now I went to this garden center and I just have to say, I loved this look. I think it's because I had been to Floriad and this was also done by a Dutchman. It is just a, it's just willow that's been woven. And so probably nobody will do this, but I've showed you many slides of it so that you could do it. Oops, two slides of it. Okay, just two. I'm trying to be short, I'm trying to be brief here. Um, this was at the Free Spirit Nursery. So if you ever want to know more about Free Spirit, I just love this nursery. I went last year, I read about it online and actually drove there. It's like 10 hours from here, but. Whatever. <laughs> um, it was six hours for me. It's in BC, but it's it's quite a way. Anyway, he just took willow and wove it. So you don't have to be constricted by buying certain string or building a certain wooden structure or even having a helpful husband. You can just weave yourself a willow, a willow thing. Okay. So commercial trellis. You can also go out to the store and buy things. And I saw this in Oregon and I absolutely loved it. And I showed, I'm showed i showing you the close-up so that you can have somebody build it for you. Just a base plate with the long pieces of, of uh, metal attached. And the base plate is then, you know, with a long, you have to somehow screw it into the ground. And then this is how it looks. So it wraps up and around. So you can make these beautiful arbors with, with this. And these ones were commercially available. I saw this at a trade show. This I saw down in Phoenix, so forget about the plants. It doesn't matter the plants, but look at this beautiful frame that they built. It's really no different than a window frame, but notice that they've attached it, lovely cement building here, but they've attached it away from the building. So whether you're growing clematis or tomatoes or beans, it doesn't matter. You should always attach them away from the building. And notice they haven't put it right down on the ground. When people get these little trellises for their clematis, they always put them right on the ground. Well, the tremellus, I mean, clematis is not a beginner. It's been around for a while. They know that um, they can grow about a foot before they have to choose which direction they're going to grow in. And then they might go north or south or who knows where. But they can kind of grow and move around. And so it's the same with all of our things, that are, whether it's beans or peas or clematis or even climbing roses, doesn't matter. You don't have to put your trellis right on the ground. The plants are smarter than that. They can get that first. They can figure that out for the first foot or even 18 inches. And then that gives you more height so that your trellis, when it's attached to the building, is a bit higher. Also, just, just keep it out from the building a bit so that you're not, you know, you can get in there and pick things is a good idea. And I really like this trellis. So these are just a few commercial things that I've seen around. Oh, and this is a terrible picture, but I never get a picture of mine. This is on page 51 of the Lee Valley catalog. <laughs> so here I am. I find this perfect object online. And it is called the Vine Spine. What a cute name, eh? Vine Spine. And look, where is it available? Because it's big. Do I want to have this shipped up from the States and pay American, or do I want to find it in Canada? Yes, I want to find it in Canada. So I phone the Vines Fine people, because I'm Donna Bowser. So I get hello, I'm Donna Bowser. Uh, where can I buy your product in Canada? Oh, you can buy it at Lee Valley Tools. So then I have to drive to Lee Valley Tools, as you would have to do. It's an hour trip down to Lee Valley Tools in the South Part of Town. You can walk through the whole store. You cannot find anything labeled Vines Fine. Just driven an hour. I just arrived at Lee Valley Tools and no one can help. So you get to the counter, the guy's not helpful. Because even though you can't find what you went for, there's about 150 other things you need at Lee Valley. <laughs> because you know, and they're just really cute. So you're buying, you got your cart full, and the guy says, Did you find everything you need? And you say, No, I wanted to buy some fine spines and I couldn't find them. He said, Well, what do you mean? Do you mean like trellis panels? And 
That's not the name the manufacturer calls them. They call them fine spike. So trellis panels, I'll just point out, and you could probably make these at home if you're super helpful, handy. They have these little hooks. So each of these little hooks hooks into the next one beside it. So you make either, like in this case, they made a square, and I had to take the picture out of the catalog because I realized they're harder to take a picture of in the garden because you got this piece of spine and there's like miles of garden mine. I couldn't figure it out. But each little piece hooks together. So you can make a square and then grow something straight up. Or you can make, what I like to do is just make like, like a zigzag and then have the peas growing on them or the beans. So I absolutely love the trennis petals on page 51 of the Lee Valley catalog. So I'm off at the counter and the guy is saying, do I have everything, everything you need? And I said, no, I couldn't find the vine spine. And he said, oh, probably talking about the trellis panels. And they weren't even out in the warehouse. Like, they don't have them there. They've got them in the back 40 in the back shelf. So he goes into this other box. So I got two boxes of them, and I have to say, out of everything else I've tried, <laughs> love these. And then when you take them out in the fall, because they're just like little spokes that are sticking down into the sun, you just pull them up, and they all pack flat, and just lay them beside your garage, or throw them on the ground, or whatever you do with your things in the fall. But they're away. Yeah, they're easy to put away, and easy to pick up. And I would even, and because they're quite tall, they're six feet tall, seven feet tall? They're quite tall. They're, uh, they're good for almost everything that you might want to, um, to grow. So now I have to summarize because I see, um, so how about this living wall? Have you seen anything like this? This is called the um, pocket something. I've lost its name now, poly pocket. It's a piece of felt and you hang it on your wall and you have two little screws, one here and one here, that hangs on the wall and it is so cute. What did I tell you about living walls? So in about a week, <laughs> this is how it looks about a week. If you've got, say you've got a good gardener, it might still look good in a week, but if you've got someone like me who maybe has things to do all day, every day, you cannot keep soil in a little tiny two inch wide place. It's just, well, maybe you could. I mean, I'm not saying you could. I'm just saying that I've given up on wall plantings because I find them to be very difficult. They take much more water than you don't think. They evaporate so much, they have so little soil volume, you have to figure out what they need and when they need it. And you might have to water them every 15 minutes if it's hot. And most people I know don't have that much time, even the retired people. Because plants, the truth is plants love real soil. They want to be in the ground, they want to get out there, and they want to find the fungus. They work in association with the bacteria and the fungus, and there's a whole system going on. And when they're trapped in a little thing on your wall, they can't reach out to their buddies. It doesn't help the bees either. So the plants love real soil. You can try espalier, and now this one I probably wouldn't be able, I wouldn't be talented enough to do, but it sure looks good in other people's yards. And you can even put edibles on trellises. So you don't have to put, um, of course you can put edibles, but you don't have to put um, vegetables. You can put things like uh, nasturtiums. This is a nasturtium, which I think looks quite nice. And I just think you need to be creative. Because there's so many things out there, just even pieces, long pieces of rebar that would work. At one point, I used hockey sticks for tomatoes, but I found A, they weren't tall enough because hockey sticks are only this big, and B, they rot mid season. The same problem I had with the string, the whole thing falls over. So, hockey sticks, maybe. But, anyways, be creative. And whatever you do, write it down. So, this is why I created the journal, which I was here to talk to you about as well. Because a journal is like your own personal memoir. It's a place where you can write it down. Here's some potatoes chitting inside my, my uh, journal. Yeah, and so I decided that it would be no good because I'm the kind of person that writes things on seed packets and then I pack up, I got a big stack of seed packets and then I write it on the calendar. And at the end of the year, I'm house cleaning. Well, I do like to house clean at least once a year. So I pick up all the packages and I pick up the calendars and I'm recycling everything. And I'm like, all my notes were written on that seed pack. And so I just realized what, really what we need is three years because as the weather is changing and as we change as gardeners, you need a space so that you can write three years in a row in the same space. Because if you're like me and you start to get really long-winded, like obviously I am tonight, you'll end up with um, pages and pages about June 12th, but nothing on at all the other days. So this, I only give you room for one line a day because you have to compare it over three years and get stickers. Oh shoot, there's the stickers. I didn't bring any stickers. I'll bring stickers. So what to do? Faster than bringing bunnies. Oh, where's our sign? There it is. Cultivate creatively. Grow up. I just put the web page. Callie helped me with this. We put the web page on here because I realized all the people, you, those people that are here, I'll give you a card. 
You can make sure to sign up for my webpage because I always send out, like when I started my potatoes, there's little videos on there and there's all these little things about mistakes made in Donna's garden. We could do a whole show on just that. <laughs> yeah, well, I thought this was a good idea, but you know, this is why it didn't work. Anyway, um, just just follow along. I would love it if you wanted to sign up for my webpage. It's donnabalzer.com. And for all of you not here, but somewhere else, you can do that. And oops, I just want you to have fun. Aww. Do I have one more slide? No, I'm done. I'm done, so have fun. Whatever you do, be a good one. Have a book called that. Whatever you do, be a good one. Thank you so much.